good and gracious God, we thank you for a beautiful sunny morning today. Uh, and I just pray now that over these words that I have prepared, Lord, I pray that they are your words and uh, that they speak uh, of your heart for your people, Lord. And I pray that today our worship will be most acceptable in your sight, Lord, that you will hear our praises as they float up to the heavens. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I've said a few times here, today is the day in the church calendar known as Christ the King Sunday. What that is, is it's the final Sunday in the church year. Church year is a little different than the calendar year. Um, We've made our way through Luke's gospel this past year, uh, through the life of Jesus from his birth uh, to his te- through his you know, teachings and his life to his resurrection. And now he's going to be lifted up as the ultimate king who will return for his beloved and faithful. There about the new church year starts next week with Advent. Well, as I said, Jesus is the king, the king who will return for his faithful. And it's odd, I think, that the text would pick up on this humiliation as he is making his way to the cross. What an interesting text, I thought, when I first read it. Yet, ironically on the cross, this is where Jesus demonstrates most fully, okay, that uh, he is more glorious uh, than any other king that has ever lived. And his kingship isn't diminished by his making his way to the cross, it's increased, and it's increased dramatically. I would submit to you that never has there been such a true king uh, that bore what Jesus bore, as we learn about in today's gospel. There is another remarkable revealing of this one true king, Jesus the Christ. There's no doubt by the way, that there have been some fairly remarkable kings and leaders throughout history. I watched Netflix. You guys know that I watch Netflix a lot. Um, The other day, I watched a movie called The King. It was about England's King Henry V, who came to power in an unlikely way in the 15th century. He was known as Prince Hal. And even though he was the eldest son of of, uh, King Henry IV, he was caught up in this life of drunken debauchery. As such, he was told his younger brother was the one who was going to get the crown, but then word arrives that his younger brother has been killed in battle. And what takes place in the movie is this remarkable um, uh, transformation of Prince Hal. He becomes Henry V, and he is determined to put an end to these uh, endless wars and killing that have been fostered by his father. And he displays on several occasions that he's kind, he has a kind and merciful heart, he has a real true desire to do the right thing. But in the end, and again, this is a spoiler alert, I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, (laughs) but in the end, he is deceived by a person in his inner circle and manipulated into going into war with France. See, even what my point here is that even the best of men and women can be deceived in the end. The Lord Jesus was never deceived, nor ignorant of his circumstances, nor the intent of the people around him. He orchestrated his every move. He controlled every discussion as he moved toward his crucifixion. It had all been preordained since before he was ever born of a woman on earth. So I want to remind us at the outset, what are some things that make Jesus a king? Well, let me share a couple of things with you here. First of all, incomparable teacher. He is an incomparable teacher. He is a powerful miracle worker. Let us not forget that. He's compassionate and kind. He's a perfectly accurate judge of men and women. He was, recall, the embodiment of truth, virtue, and wisdom, and love. He was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament predictions And he was announced by God's messenger, his forerunner, John the Baptist. Now that's the only way, friends, you could recognize this Jewish carpenter who looked otherwise ordinary as Messiah. So that when Jesus then, as we see today, stumbles with the weight of the cross beam going toward the cross, when Jesus knows the pain of these twisted 
thorns being formed into a crown and forced down into his skull as he undergoes this uh, scourging, the worst form of punishment, one of the worst I could think of where his back literally became ribbons of torn flesh. It was a horrible, graphic, pathetic thing to see. The pain and suffering endured on that road to the cross would demonstrate what could only be done by one individual, and he was the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus. It was a heart-wrenching thing to see, and it was enough to call forth compassion of many people who were strung along on that route called the Via Dolorosa as he was making his way toward Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there were some who wept and mourned for him. We should also recognize something here, I believe, and that is the shame that Jesus, our King, had to bear in order to save us from sin. Now, I think if I were to ask any of you, if we were going to suffer, we would prefer to do it uh, in a private place, right? Recall this, Jesus suffered shame publicly in front of everyone in the public arena. But there were, there were these gawkers who were strung out along the road and the crowd was beginning to build as he's going to the cross. And along the way, Jesus comes across this uh, crowd of mourning, weeping, wailing women. And the conversation that takes place, that's what I want to focus on today. Now this is, uh, for the most part, what some women did when men were on their way to execution. Um, They were professional mourners. There was an author, Kent Hughes, who described what these women were doing this way. This is what he said. These were devout women of Jerusalem who had come to bewail the death of a young man. Local women who regularly turned out to witness executions and provide opiates and drugs to ease the pain. Some were acting out the part of professional mourners as they literally were beating themselves and bewailing him. These daughters of Jerusalem were well-intentioned, sympathetic, kind souls. And there's one thing I would add to this. The offering of opiates and drugs, that's somewhat in question. It was a late uh, addition from something called the Babylonian Talmud. And we can't be sure that this was in place at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Now, while part of this tradition of these women was symbolic and ritualistic, there was at least a notion that in part... Some of them were really sincere. They felt true grief, sorrow, and and sympathy for this man, Jesus. These wailing women, um, I want us to appreciate also, they're unique in Luke's account. And it's as if, I believe Luke is saying, look at how the Son of God responds to these women. How he points to his glory and his authority as the Son of the God incarnate. We could describe Jesus' response in three words. Just three words, provocation, prophecy, and proverb. Provocation, prophecy, and proverb. What do I mean by that? Well, provocation. Jesus shocks these women and provokes them when he turns to them and responds. He's doing it so that he can wake them up. He wants to wake up everyone who's around him and listening, getting their attention uh, to the scenario being played out before him. These women, you see, they serve in a symbolic way for the entire Jewish nation. Jesus addresses them as a perfect prophet of God who brings to light the spiritual danger that these Jews are in. He uses an Old Testament prophetic phrase when he refers to them as daughters of Jerusalem. He goes on to say, Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The phrase, that phrase, daughters of Jerusalem, okay? It's a a phrase symbolic of the nation of Israel. It's used several times in the Old Testament for both positive and and negative reasons. Uh, Zephaniah 3.14 is one of the positive ones. It says, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And so there are these women mourning, weeping, and wailing for this beaten man. And Jesus turns to them and addresses them. This, friends, this is remarkable to me. It's a true sign 
that unlike any other, Jesus is always extending himself on behalf of others. What he says to this woman is shocking. And to think that I never picked up on this before. We were talking in Sunday school about how you read the Bible, you read the scriptures, and you see something different like every time you read them. He says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. In other words, just stop for a moment and think. Don't mourn and weep for me, but for yourselves and for your children. I don't know what these women were thinking, how Jesus would respond to them. Maybe he thought he, that, they would, uh, that he would thank them or praise them. And while Jesus might have spoken his words kindly, they were meant to provoke thought. So what was it Jesus was meaning to communicate to these wailing women? Well, firstly, he demonstrates his selflessness once again. He wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about these women and the lost multitudes of the people of Israel who are trapped in a religious system that had lost its way. It was actually alienated from the true God. It also speaks of the sinfulness of the people. For to say, stop weeping for me and for yourselves has to mean at some level, your situation is actually worse than mine if you were to realize what your true condition is. In other words, you're blind to the true state of things here. Think about that for a moment, because in our day, the same thing goes on. You may hear of people who are sympathetic to Christians. We know that Christians all over the world are being persecuted. Some may empathize, but at the same time fail to see the greater tragedy of their own plight. For to die without Christ represents the true and ultimate tragedy in all of life. Jesus will die. It will be gut-wrenching and heartbreaking, but he will rise to ascend to heaven, preparing to return for the faithful. He'll be okay, but those who die not surrendering their lives to him, they're the ones who are going to perish. So Jesus moves then from provocation, getting them to think, to prophecy. Verses 29 and 30, he says, For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, the breasts that never nursed. They will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. In other words, Jesus says, Weep for yourselves. Because I'm telling you what's coming, and it's going to be horrific. And what we see depicted here, uh, Jesus talks about events both near and far. Some things that are on the near horizon, such as the complete fall and destruction of Jerusalem and the beloved temple, and events that will happen far off in the distant future. There's something worse than the tribulation to come upon the earth. It's incomparable, Jesus is saying, to anything that's happened before without Christ. Every sinner who doesn't have Christ enters into everlasting torment. Without Jesus, you can expect nothing but eternal damnation. And as people are blind to things spiritual, and we're back then, they are still today. You often hear people speak of a person who, like, have, for example, has been through a terrible illness and then passes away. And haven't you all heard many people, maybe you've said this, well, at least their suffering is over. Can I remind us all today of this? It's true for the person who is a believer, but if you're not a believer, the suffering's only just beginning. It will be worse than what a person suffers in a hospital or anything in this life. It will be never ending. Do we ever stop and try and imagine what happens to a person who dies without Christ? Because I think if we did, wouldn't we be running out there into the community uh, as though someone's house was on fire to give them the good news? And then you think of it this way. To suffer on your own is one thing. To watch your children suffer, that is unbearable. I know that as a father. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying to these women who have misjudged the situation, not understood what is happening, um, he says, you've misjudged your own standing before God. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. He gets their attention, okay? And we have prophecy, the foretelling of horrific things to come. And then... He concludes with a proverb. This is what he says. 
For if these things, if, if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? That was probably a common proverb that was spoken at the time. People probably understood it to a certain extent. There are a lot of commentators who have all kinds of different thoughts about what this proverb means, but maybe it's best to take it on its surface level. Wood that's green is not what you want for a fire, right? No, Everybody knows that. If you're going to make a fire, you go out and you find the old, deadest wood, driest wood you can find for your fire. Well, what is Jesus trying to say here? If you think that this is bad, I really think this is what he's saying. If you think it's bad now, wait till you see what's coming. If the holy and innocent one is given to horrible treatment that he didn't, didn't deserve, what's going to happen to those who deserve the fires of judgment? Uh, there was a theologian who commented on this, and his name uh, is Daryl Bach. He says, Jesus makes a comparison. He is the green or damp wood. The nation in future judgment is the dry wood. Jesus presents a lesser to greater argument, he says. If this is what happens to a living tree, what might happen to a dead one? In the latter case of the dead one, it's as if the sinner is looking at what Jesus has done and saying, "Uh, no thank you, I'll pass. I don't need you, Jesus, right now. What awaits a person who rejects such a gift? So I want to ask you to then apply this in three different ways. Three different ways. First, if you're a believer in Christ, you trust, okay, that he is son of the living God. And uh, when is the last time, though, you gave sober thought to what it is you've been delivered from? When is the last time you took the time to meditate on the wrath of God that is coming and let it sink in that there's no longer any condemnation for you? There is no fear of the wrath of God because the wrath of God was placed squarely on the back of Jesus so you and I could be delivered from that wrath. What I'm asking you to do is to consider the fear that you would feel if God hadn't taken that wrath on himself. Secondly, if you're not a believer, you could be a person out there who, you know, who hears about God and listens and so forth, but maybe uh, someone in your family or whatever has been concerned. They don't know if you really are a believer, if you've given your heart to Jesus. Consider for a moment what you might be headed for. Would the son, let, me, let me just pose it this way. Would the Son of God have left heaven and come to earth, living the life he lived, the suffering and, the under, and death he underwent, if death were not absolutely necessary for your eternal life? If there was any other way for you to avoid the fires of hell and the wrath of God, would Jesus have done such a thing? Uh, Would you this morning flee from the wrath of God, repent, and run to the Son of God and embrace Him as the Lord who saves? That's the second thing. Thirdly, if we know Christ, and if we embrace our role as ambassadors of Christ, we're the ones who are going to deliver Christ to the world. Are we more concerned with our suffering than we are with the wrath of God that's coming on the rest of the world? That's the question, right? If, are, we going to, are we willing to go all the way to where we can say to the world as we suffer for His name, don't weep for me, weep for yourself. It's not disciples who are the ones to be wept over. It's those without Jesus. It goes directly to our purpose here, for it's an incredible position that God has placed us in. I can't say it better than Paul's words. He, made, he says this about your life with Christ. To live is Christ, to die is what? Gain, right? That's where we are. We miss the mark and sin when we become more concerned about our treatment in the world than we do for the souls that are perishing. And why? Our future is secure. Do we in effect say, weep for me? Because, friends, we're not to be pitied. You know, we are the objects of an incredible, the grace of God. We've been pitied by God and we have been shown 
the greatest of mercy. We, therefore, are to be spent on behalf of others. That's to be our life. Are we living with that mindset? Does this describe us at St. John and the other churches we attend? Someone put it this way. No, it was quite good. We are here as missionaries to a lost and dying world, and we should be weeping for those souls. Is that us? Does that describe us? So here at the cross is God's glory made known in His Son, the true King of kings and Lord of lords, at a point of His greatest human frailty and His People show compassion and weep for him. What does he do? He provokes their thoughts. How he did this in his state, I have no idea. He provokes their thoughts. He prophesies their future. And he gives them a proverb that indicates the ones to be pitied are the ones that haven't been reconciled to God. What he does here is he reaches out in love, even as he suffers the most unjust punishment that anyone ever suffered. And so I just want to leave us with this. I hope and pray that we will begin to learn how to do the same. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Kent Hollis. I hope this message was meaningful to you and touched your heart in some way. We encourage you to check out our website at sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlcmetro.com. You can get further information regarding our ministry here at St. John Lutheran Church. And may the Lord bless you richly as you seek to be in relationship with him.